I was born in 1944 in Los Angeles. I had an older brother. I have an older sister who's passed on, and a younger sister. And my folks moved us down to Rancho Santa Fe in 1948. No, we weren't wealthy at all. We had a one-story ranch house, pretty shabby, on an acre of land. My brother had two hogs that he was raising for 4-H. We had chickens. My sister and I had a burro, and I got a horse when I was about eight. My dad was sort of like the Eddie Albert character on Green Acres. He was the gentleman farmer, but he loved it. He did what he could do. There was always music in our house. They, we had a hi-fi uh, console in the living room, and they had wonderful taste in music. They had Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Nat King Cole, Ella Fitzgerald, everyone. So we always, I always heard that music. I loved it. In the, in, uh, prior to Elvis Presley's coming out in 1955, the radio, AM radio, was pretty bleak. We had Perry Como, Vaughn Monroe, Rosemary Clooney, Bing Crosby. But I liked it. I liked music. I really loved all of it. And uh, about 1955, of course, Elvis came out and exploded with Heartbreak Hotel. And then a wonderful bunch of singers came along, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, etc. You know the whole story. I loved it. I didn't want to play guitar. Then I just loved the music. I was in the fifth or sixth grade, then we used to dance, and we'd go to have parties, we'd dance, and all that. it was great. In 1959, most of that good music went to sleep, and, it, and we, we had Frankie Avalon and Fabian, no, no offense to them, they were decent artists, but they were on the radio then. And right around the corner, on college campuses, folk music was starting out. And the Kingston Trio had a hit single in 1958, Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley. I don't know how that happened, but it was a very popular song. And uh, I liked them. And my older sister came home from the University of Colorado with a stack of albums. She had Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, Lead Belly, The Weavers. I loved it. I went right over that kind of music, more of a, of a roots-oriented folk music. And that's when I wanted to learn the guitar. And my mother and I went to Tijuana and got a guitar for $10. I kid you not. And it was a good guitar. It worked. It, it, it played great. I learned all my chords on it. And I was sitting practicing in my room. Then I heard bluegrass music, and that hit a nerve with me. You wouldn't believe. I, highly improvisational, upbeat, hillbilly jazz. Two-part, three-part, four-part vocals. I just loved it. Mandolin, guitar, banjo, bass, fiddle. Fantastic. My father thought, I was crazy, and I, uh, he, he'd walk by my room when I was playing some of those bluegrass records. He said, Betty, did, uh, are you sure this is our son? Uh, he wasn't left on a doorstep by a family from Kentucky. <laughs> but uh, I heard the mandolin. I heard Bill Monroe play the mandolin on a record, and I went, that's it. I don't know why, but it just hit me, and I went out and found a mandolin. I found a little mandolin to learn how to play on. And there really wasn't anybody to learn from back then. I was a surfer. I used to surf all the time. I would hang out with the older guys who were hardcore surfers. And they didn't listen to surf music. They listened to Muddy Waters and Flatten and Scruggs and Bill Monroe. It was very interesting. They took me under their wing and always looked out for me. And I'd go to their parties and get into mischief. And I met a couple guys from San Diego uh, who uh, were musicians a little older than I was. And Kenny Wirtz and Gary Carr. And Kenny played the banjo and Gary played the guitar. They had started out in the Kingston Trio music and they had gone into bluegrass too. So we immediately hit it off. And we start interacting and playing. Our learning tools were records. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have uh, DVD, instructional DVDs and all of that. And I was still struggling with the mandolin. And Kenny and Gary and I would take long trips up to L.A. to the Ash Grove, two clubs within a mile radius of each other. The Ash Grove, which dealt in roots music, and up the street was the Troubadour, which was more commercial folk music. We would go to the Ash Grove, and we heard the Stanley Brothers, Flatt and Scruggs, Bill Monroe, Lightning Hopkins, Doc Watson. Fantastic. Just fantastic. And on one trip, we got to know this young band that was playing in the uh, Ash Grove called the Kentucky Colonels. And these guys were, one. the guitar player was my age, Clarence White. And I got to know him really well. And on one trip up, we went to see the Kentucky Colonels, and there was a fellow playing mandolin with them because Roland, uh, Clarence's brother, Roland, was in the Army, and he was filling in. And I said, do you give lessons? He said, I live up in Berkeley. Can you come up to Berkeley? I went, I think I can. And I got on the train in Del Mar, and I rode all the way up to Oakland, took a 
God knows how I got to Berkeley, and I went to his door, and I had two days of wonderful lessons with him. He showed me all the basics, what pick to use, use your wrist, the chords, great. He said, now go home and practice, which I did. I just had that love for music, a passion. I go back home, and I'm playing. And also, by the way, I was watching every Saturday night, watching these country music shows from L.A. that were live. Cliffy Stone's Hometown Jamboree, Tex Ritter's Town Hall Party, and Cal's Corral. Cal being Cal Worthington, the Dodge dealer. <laughs> I mean, on Cal's Corral was a bluegrass band called the Golden State Boys. I'd watch them every Saturday. I'd take a, a, ask a girl out on a date. Poor thing would have to watch Cal's Corral. <laughs> I just had that love for music. And uh, I did, I'd say, I, I started working on the mandolin, and, and things were going good, and then we had a tragedy in the family in 1960 when my dad passed away. And unbeknownst to us, we were in terrible shape financially. We didn't know this, but uh, we, we were in debt. We had no money at all. My mother sat us down. My brother was in the Air Force. My older sister was married, so my mother sits my sister and I down. She says, we're going to have to make some changes. We're going to we have to go to Los Angeles. Moved to Los Angeles into a little apartment, barely a one-bedroom apartment, right on the outskirts of Beverly Hills, near right where Century City is now. I went to night school to get my high school credits. I got a job at the May Company, Wilshire and Fairfax. My little sister went to Beverly Hills High. I still played music. I still practiced the mandolin and the guitar. And I went to the Ashgrove. I was much closer to the Ash Grove now. But I went over there. I met some guys from Pasadena that played bluegrass. And I got together with them. In December of 62, I turned 18. I get a call from Kenny, my friend, the banjo player. And he's putting a band together. Would you like to play mandolin? I said, I'd love to. I, asked, I sat my mom down and said, Kenny called, putting a band together in San Diego. She says, and you want to go? I said, yeah. She said, and how are you going to support yourself? I said, I'll figure something out. She says, I think you will. And she said, we're fine. Go ahead, and the door's always open. This is a wonderful place. Off I went on my motorcycle, mandolin strapped on the back, seriously, and a duffel bag. And I went to San Diego, and I joined Scottsville Squirrel Barkers. <laughs> First bluegrass band. And along with Kenny and Gary that I'd met at these parties, there was two other fellas, older fellas, Larry Murray and Ed Douglas. They ran a guitar store called The Blue Guitar. And put on shows every weekend, similar to McCabe's in Santa Monica, guitar store and concert venue. So we started the Squirrel Barkers, and we played every week, every day, anytime we could. We would get in the car and drive up to LA, not to the Ashgrove, to the Troubadour. Troubadour had open mic, boot nanny night, boot nanny night. And that's where I met a lot of people. But we were going up there to try and get more bookings and try to get something going. And on one trip up, uh, Ed Douglas, who was a retired San Diego police officer, said we should make a record. We're going, what do we do? We're kids. We don't know. And he says he had this album by the Dillards at the back. It said, produced by Jim Dixon, World Pacific Records Studios. He said, I'm going to call. He calls World Pacific Studio on our way to L.A., and Jim Dixon happened to be in the building. He was not a staff producer or anything. He just happened to be there. And he said, come on over. I want to hear you. We went over and played for him. He said, I love it. But I, I, unfortunately, there's nothing I can do for you right now. There's an outfit about six blocks away called Brown Records. And they might be interested in doing a record with you. And we called him. The guy said, come over. Same thing. We go over there, play. He said, I love this. Let's make a record. Crown Records was very low key. It was they made records that used to be able to buy albums at the supermarket for 79 cents. Seriously. And uh, we came back up, made arrangements. We came back up and we recorded an album. And their way they did this was no uh, all public domain songs. There was no royalty stream at all. Cut it live, sing it, play it, put it on the tape. We did. We came up with an album four hours. Probably one of the best records I was ever done. I made. I'm serious. And, and we played. We were kids. We played without fear. We just went for it. And while we were recording, he was mixing it to two track. It was almost like, well, getting your car painted at Earl Shy. We went there. We did the album in four hours. And then he said, go over. We need to do an album cover. We have a photographer on call. We go to Griffith Park, and we get a, a cover made. 
and it's on the wall, you know, the Scottsville Squirrel Burgers. One day service, <laughs> completely done. And within six weeks, we had copies of the album. Each got a box of records at $10. That's what we made on that album. Now, ironically, it got picked up by a company in England. God knows how they did that. It's still in print and still no royalties. So, <laughs> it was, as I say, uh, strictly passion for the music, complete passion. The squirrel barkers uh, would go up to play the Who night and keep doing that. And we went, we played a bluegrass festival in Pasadena at the Ice House, very well known. That's where I met Herb Peterson for the first time, 1963. And uh, also the Kentucky Colonels, who I'd gotten to know, they were playing on this festival. Herb's band, the Pine Valley Boys, the Golden State, the guys I watched on TV, and the Squirrel So that was an interesting time. They come back and uh, from LA, and all of a sudden, Karen, Kenny and Gary get their draft notices. So the Squirrel Barkers are basically done. And I, uh, I don't know what I was doing in that interim, but all of a sudden, uh, Don Parmley, the leader of the Golden State Boys, the banjo player, called me and he said, we're looking for a mandolin player. Are you interested in coming over? And I said, yeah, I am. And I go to Norwalk, drive up to Norwalk, and took me up there. <laughs> I played with these guys and they hired Don Parmley, Burn and Rex Gosden. Burn Gosden became a huge country star in the late 80s. His brother Rex was a very, excuse me, very successful songwriter. And they hired, they were in their 30s. These guys were all from the South. Don was from Kentucky. Burn and Rex were from Alabama. They were my window on authenticity. Okay? And he said, get your clothes together. We're going to Nevada tomorrow. Okay? And I came back the next day and we went to Nevada. Not Las Vegas, not yeah. Reno. To jackpot. Jackpot, pardon me. Jackpot Nevada is on the northeastern border of Idaho. Consisted of <laughs> consisted of one casino, gas station, and small market, and a very suspicious motel. <laughs> and a trailer behind the casino. That's where he put us up. Two week engagement. And boy, did I learn that music every night playing with these guys. They were so good. And the thing that I learned that I think you don't quite learn by learning off of a record in your bedroom or your dorm room or wherever, I learned about the culture, where this music came from. By being around them, I learned about what they ate, what they thought, this and that. They were wonderful guys. They really took care of me. Come back from Jackpot after two weeks, we played every hillbilly bar in Los Angeles County. Okay. I was 18, I had a fake ID. And every bartender would say, yeah, kid, don't get caught, because I looked like I was 12 years old. We played the night John Kennedy was killed. Nobody in the bar that night, I don't know why he had us working. But it was great, and we worked on Cal's Corral. So there I am, I'm, I'm on the show that I used to watch when I was in high school. And I'd see all these great country stars come through, and it was just wonderful. And that went on for a while until, unfortunately, the guys all had families, and they just weren't making enough money to make ends meet. They had to get jobs. Don Parmley went to work for Continental Trailways. Vernon Rex went to construction. I fell into yet another band. Now, mind you, folks, I, I always thought that, okay, we'll see what happens. I'm going to go register for the next semester at school. I thought that would happen. And something would always open up an opportunity. So I get a job with this band that's forming uh, Randy Sparks, who put the Christie Minstrels together, had a club on Westwood Boulevard called Ledbetters. And he had shows every night there. And he was putting a, together a band called the Greengrass Group. And I got hired, I auditioned. The Greengrass Group was like a combination of Little Abner and Beverly Williams. It was not the bluegrass I listened to or loved. It was dreadful, but I got $100 a week and I had a place to stay because Randy had a house in Encino that all the artists could live in. So that was a good thing. And I just dealt with that, played every night at, at Ledbetter's. Uh, in February of 64, I happened to be at my mom's house on a Sunday night. Pardon me, one second. We had dinner. And like every other family in America, in February of 1964, we turned on Ed Sullivan's show. Everybody watched. 
that particular night, the Beatles were first time they were on TV, first time they appeared in America on television, and I was mesmerized. They were so good. They were uplifting, great songs. They looked good. They sang great. It was live. It was just fantastic. And my wonderful mother said, they're pretty good. You know? And I said, yeah, I think so. And I left that night and went back to Encino and back to Ledbetter's next day. Two, three weeks later, uh, I forgot to so, uh, The Golden State Boys, we wanted to make an album too. I, I said, I know somebody we can call, and I called Jim Dixon, the man that helped the Squirrel Barkers, and he heard us play in the studio. He said, I love it, I want to make a record. He started taping us, we started doing an album. That was happening. He was hoping to place this record with Vanguard or Electra, one of the folk labels. So we had that in a can ready to go, and we kept working, and, but the guys had to get jobs, so the Golden State Boys were done at that point. Back to what I was talking about, I'm in the Greengrass group, making my hundred dollars, which was a blessing. I get uh, a call from Jim Dixon about a month after I saw the Beatles, and he said, do you know David Crosby, uh, Roger McGuinn, Gene Clark? I said, no, I don't know them. I know who they are. I've seen them at the Troubadour. He said, they're putting a group together. Would you like to come down and listen to them? I said, okay, I'll come down after work, down to World Pacific. There they are in the studio. Uh, Roger's got one Gibson acoustic guitar, and Gene and David, they're singing. They're singing Beatles songs, and they're singing some songs that Gene had written. They were good. They were really good. And I had high standards. I had worked with the Gosden Brothers and the Golden State Boys, and they were really good singers. So I had these very high level. And I said, these guys are good. And I talked to Jim. I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, well, David's going to be the bass player. We're going to get a drummer. I said, oh, great. So back to Ledbetter's I go to play the Beverly uh, Hillbillies Bluegrass. <laughs> Jim called me, three more weeks pass, he calls me up, he says, you know, David's not comfortable playing the bass. Can you play the bass? I said, and I knew where he was going. So I said, yeah. I'd never touched a bass in my life, <laughs> ever. Not, didn't even, hadn't even held one. He said, can you get a bass? I said, well, I think so. And I found one for $50, horrible instrument, red bass. He said, can you come down? I come down. Two, three days later, I come down to World Pacific. I meet the guys. Over in the corner is a fella, very good-looking guy, younger than us, long hair. He had cardboard boxes set up, a cymbal, a brush, and a stick. This is our drummer, Michael Clark. I went, hmm, are we doing a skiffle band or a jug band here? What is this? And, I, you know, and, and, we, and there was an old amp in the studio. We plug in. Roger McGuinn and I plug in. I plug the bass in. He plugs his guitar, and he put a pickup in his 12 and we start playing, and it's rough, very rough. But we started playing every night at World Pacific Studios. Jim would run tape on us. So now we were a five-piece band. Didn't have a name yet, kept playing. Uh, Jim became our manager and producer, and his partner, Eddie Tickner, was an accountant. He handled Odetta, he handled some other folk acts, and also worked with Hirschhorn family, And their daughter, Naomi, invested in the birds. Didn't loan us money, invested. For 2%, she gave us $5,000. 2% of future record royalties. The woman made more money than I ever saw. I don't know if that's true, but it was great. So, and, the, and, and we were such a, a camaraderie, a band, and we were so together starving, and we'd go to the Pix Theater on Hollywood Boulevard and watch A Hard Day's Night. I watched it 10 times, the first Beatles movie. Fantastic movie, you haven't seen it. Our days, we knew exactly what kind of instruments to get. We got our 5,000 from Naomi Hirshhorn. Roger bought a 12-string Rickenbacker electric guitar. David bought a six-string guitar. I bought a bass, Fender bass. And Michael got some Ludwig drums, just like Ringo. And we bought two amps. 5,000 covered that whole 1964. And we start playing again. We had the gear now. Now we're working, playing. Uh, Gene's writing a lot of songs. Roger's writing songs. It's great. Jim Dixon had spent a lot of time in the 50s in jazz and folk music as more of a record producer in sort of that, that, that area. And he knew Bob Dylan's manager, Albert Grossman, who's in New York City. Albert Grossman managed Bob Dylan, Ian and Sylvia, and Peter, Paul, and Mary. Somehow, Jim got a hold of a copy of a 
song Bob had just written called Mr. Tambourine. And he brought it in, this tape of Bob Dylan's Mr. Tambourine Man. On tape was Bob and Ramblin' Jack Elliott, two of them. And Bob had written a song, it's almost like a country song. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me. And we hated it. <laughs> so he says, you guys sit down. He says, you need to go for depth and substance in your music. You're, you need to make records you're going to be proud of in 50 years. Greatest advice I ever got. Roger McGuinn took that song home and arranged it, and he took it out of that 2-4 country beat and put it in a 4-4 beat, which was danceable. And at the time, AM radio, you had maybe 2 minutes 40 seconds on the air. You couldn't do an al a record for, at 3 minutes or anything beyond that. So we did one verse out of three. Beautiful, beautiful lyrics in that song. And we did a tape of it, and now we needed to get a record deal. This is a good part. This is an interesting part. Jim takes the tape we had made over to his friend Benny Shapiro, who owned the Renaissance. It was a club across the street from Ciro's on the Sunset Strip. It's a jazz club. And he plays it for Benny. He says, I'm working with these kids. What do you think? He plays the Mr. Tambourine Man tape that we did. And Benny's daughter is 13 years old. She's upstairs, comes running down the stairs. She says, Dad, who is that? I love that. And Benny says to Jim, that's good enough for me. <laughs> and Jim says, I just want to get my foot in the door. I want to get these guys a, a deal of some kind. And, Jim, and Benny says, let me make a phone call. He called Miles Davis. Miles Davis was on Columbia Records, and Miles Davis got us a record deal. OK, and we never even met him. And he hadn't even heard us. Uh, he said, he said to, to uh, Benny, do they swing? Well, Benny says, they sound pretty good, Miles. And Miles got us a deal. He called the president of Columbia Records. We had a singles deal, meaning if your single took off on the radio, you would do an album and have a, a full deal. We were assigned to producer Terry Melcher, Doris Day's son, great guy, young guy, understood the music, understood what we were doing, loved all of them. And we go in to record, and before we did that, Terry sat us down, he said, you know what, you guys, we've got this one shot. I think we need to use some session players. And I didn't care, I said, okay, I understand, I think we better, he said, we gotta really make a great record, almost perfect, to introduce you to the public. So the Wrecking Crew played on Mr. Tambourine Man and the flip side, which is a song Gene Clark had written called I Knew I'd Want You. Roger McGuinn played on it, Roger, David, and Gene sang it. And Mike and I watched it all go down. We were fine. And the record was great. And uh, around that time, as we had gotten the record done, here we had a single ready to go out to the radio, uh, another interesting man came into our life, Derek Taylor. Derek Taylor had been the publicist for the Beatles, had left Brian Epstein, Brian Epstein's right-hand man. Ivor, is that right? OK. <laughs> and uh, Derek comes over to America with his family. And his first clients were the Beach Boys, and he took us home. And he knew Bob Eubanks, the big DJ at KRLA, who later hosted the Newlywed Game, and up until a year or two ago was announcing the Rose Parade. And Bob Eubanks had Mr. Tambourine Man. And at the same time, we get a really good gig. We get hired by, at Ciro's by Frank Sands Jr. The nightclub business was dead. It was TV had taken over. Nobody went to nightclubs anymore. But they, he was smart enough to start booking rock acts, and he booked us in for two weeks. And we scrambled to get material enough for three sets a night. I even sang lead on a few things. I wasn't even a singer yet, but it was great. We're working at Ciro's. The record is released, and Bob has it in light rotation. It becomes medium rotation. It gets get heavy rotation on the air and it starts to get picked up by other stations, and it starts climbing up the charts. While we're working at Ciro's, we're building up this huge following. People are lining up to come and see us after two weeks. Word of mouth. The record went to number one, 1965. Went to number one in England, all over Western Europe. Ciro's held us over for another two weeks. We were doing incredible business. And then that summer, we toured America, and then we went to England. Derek wanted to march back in with his band, The Birds. I think he wanted to show Brian Epstein what I did. I don't know. But we went to England on tour. We met the Beatles. They were wonderful, very supportive, very sweet guys. And they loved us. They were just terrific. We played in England. We come back. We start recording an album. Now we had an album. And uh, 
after that album was done in the fall of 65, they wanted another single. And Roger had worked on a song called Turn, Turn, Turn with Toot and Collins before he joined the Birds. And Turn, 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 as you know, I feel was the signature song of the Birds. Uh, it was Pete Seeger had taken scripture from the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes 3, and put music to it. And it was, it was our signature tune. We played on it, we played on everything after the first two songs. Turn, 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 shot to number one, all over America, Europe, everything. We were going, we were really going well, playing TV shows all over New York and LA, working all the time, continually recording and touring. This is the pattern, make a record, tour, make a record, tour. 1966, Gene decided to leave, he had some issues. I was promoted to the front line. If you ever look at an old birds video on YouTube, I'm the guy in the back that's not smiling and playing the bass, standing like this. I was scared to death. That's bluegrass. <laughs> if you ever watch a bluegrass band, they don't smile. They're serious. And uh, 66, I promoted the front line. I'm singing Crosby and, and, and it just started to develop for me. I got a little more, I got over my shyness. In 1967, I wrote my first song and proceeded to write a bunch of songs which we recorded on an album called Younger Than Yesterday in 1967. So it was a big coming out for me. It was quite nice. Um, we lasted until 68 in that particular lineup. And then uh, we were working on an album called Notorious Bird Brothers. And David left. We had a little difference of opinion with Roger and I and David. David left. And then shortly thereafter, Michael left. So Roger and I are sitting there in the studio. And we said, well, we got to finish this record. So we bring a couple of people we knew in to play with us, a couple of session players. And it turned out to be one of our better records, Notorious Bird Brothers. And then we decided we better rebuild this band. 1968, we started rebuilding the band. We hired a young fellow from Florida named Graham Parsons. <laughs> and Graham had all the ambition you could ever want and energy. We needed that so badly. He gave us new life. And Graham loved country music, so immediately I loved him because I came out of country music. And Roger and Graham I, and I sat down and decided to go to Nashville and make an album called Sweetheart of the Rodeo. That's what we ended up calling it. We weren't trying to get into the country music uh, end of the business as much as just the birds making a country album, a one-off deal. And we did. We went to Nashville. We had some wonderful players from Nashville uh, playing with us, including John Hartford, who played that all over that record. And then Graham left. So he was with us for about five or six months. <laughs> Roger and I are going, OK. And we start to rebuild the band again. We hire Clarence White, one of the guys that was in the Kentucky Colonels. I know all these names are confusing, but there's, all, uh, there's a common thread. Clarence White had taken up the electric guitar, and he was a fantastic musician. And we hired Clarence, and we hired another fella to play drums. So we had the band. And somewhere along the line, I ran into Graham Parsons again, and he charmed me into starting a band. We said, let's start a country band. And I had been in the birds, and I was sort of frustrated. It wasn't doing much. And uh, I gave notice and started a band with Graham, the Flying Burrito Brothers, 1969. Graham and I were sharing a house in the valley. We were writing songs every day. Some of our best work, some of my best work, co-writing with Graham Parsons in that year. And we made an album for A&M Records, The Gilded Palace of Sin. <laughs> Flying Burrito Brothers. We couldn't get arrested. We couldn't get on country radio. We couldn't get on rock radio. Rock radio was making a transition into FM rock radio where you could have a single that was three or four minutes. And they were playing more album cuts and everything. So the restrictive AM radio format was gone at that point. I stayed uh, with the Burritos. I, I did another album. And then Graham and I had a bit of a falling out. and We parted company. I kept the band together. And I rebuilt the band. There's a wonderful video out there of us playing on Dick Cavett or something. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and the band really got really good. And we were working all the time. We were doing good business, selling tickets. And we did another studio album. And then we did a live album at Princeton. We recorded it at Princeton. And it was great. I, I created a show around the burritos. We did a rock and roll part. We did the country part. We did a bluegrass part. It was great. It worked really well. And one night we're on the road, it was 1970, and Stephen Stills was playing in Cleveland, and we were in Cleveland, I said, let's go see Stephen play. And I went way back with Stephen, back to 65 in the Buffalo Springfield. And he had two consecutive hit singles on the radio, 
and he had taken a hiatus from Crosby, Stills, and Nash and was out on the road with his big band. And I spent some time with him after the show. We talked and reminisced and all that. And I go home. He goes and finishes his tour. And I get a call from Stephen. I always got these wonderful phone calls. It's great. He says, I'm going to make another album. Can you play on it? Can you come down to some uh, sessions with me in Miami? I said, sure. Flies me down there. I show up. And the first day we record, I played guitar, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, and mandolin. And the second day, he says, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm like, oh, I must have messed up something. I don't know. He says, you know that, I remember when I came and saw you guys play the burritos at, in uh, Colorado about eight months ago? I went, yeah, I remember. He says, you know that mandolin you were playing? I went, yeah. He says, it's terrible. I said, <laughs> I said, that's not a nice thing to say, but I said, it's not a good instrument. I know, it, it's terrible. It doesn't sound good. He said, I want to show you something. He pulls this old case out and opens it up. And he says, what do you think of this one? And I look at it, and it's a 1924 Gibson Lloyd Lohr F5, the best you could possibly get. I mean, beautiful, like a Stradivarius violin. He says, try it out. I play it, and I'm in the studio. Oh, my gosh, this is beautiful. What a great instrument. He says, do you like it? And I said, I love it. He said, it's yours. I said, what do you mean it's mine? He said, I want you to have it. I said, what are you talking about? He said, no, you gave us our, you helped us get our first break in, in L.A. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you went over to the Whiskey A Go Go and you, you got us hired. I said, ah, uh, that was nothing. He said, no, I was just the bass player. What? And I had gone, I remember, I went over to the Whiskey. I'd heard the Springfield rehearse and I went, oh my God, they were so good. Neil Young, Richie Fure, Stephen Stills, drummer, bass player. I go to Elmer Valentine, who owned the Whiskey A Go Go, and I said, Elmer, I just heard the a really good band and uh, could you fit them in for a couple of nights? He said, I'll do better than that. I'll let them play this weekend, and they can open for whoever he had in there. I don't remember. He said, I'm going, doing this on your say-so. I said, OK. He kept them over for two weeks. They were so good. I took David Crosby down there, and I said, you got to hear this band. And then, of course, you know what happened later. They, Stephen and David went off. And, and the, anyway, so I, here I am with this beautiful mandolin. I'm going, oh my god, what's going on here? The next day, he says, can I talk to you for a minute? I went, oh god, he's going to take the mandolin back. <laughs> he says, what do you think about putting a band together? I said, let me think about it. I went, OK. <laughs> I was spinning my wheels in the burritos. I said, OK. And he said, we're going to play with the guys you've been working with. I said, great. He said, I'd like you to bring that steel player you were using in the Burrito Brothers, Al Perkins. I went, OK. I asked Al. He was ready to go. The band was formed, Manassas. We did a double album, finished that, did a double album. It went to number four or five in the charts. Gold record was great, great. The band was really good. I had to be kept on my toes with these guys, which was good. I liked that. And we had a good two-year run. We did another album. We toured all over Europe, the States, everywhere. And Stephen got pressured to go back with Crosby and Nash, which was fine. And I got another job offer. I always was working like that. I was such a blessed guy. I get an offer to work with, uh, start a band with J.D. Souther and Richie Fure. Richie was in the Springfield with Stephen. It's very incestuous, all of this. <laughs> we start a band, Souther, Hillman, Fure. Okay? And we make an album, same thing, go on the road, tour. And Souther, Hillman, Fure was okay. It, it never, and in hindsight, I don't think it ever got really gelled as a group. It was like three singer-songwriters with a backup band. But they were wonderful guys. We made, had a lot of fun. And we did another album. We toured. And, and it sort of fell apart. And uh, we each had signed a deal with Asylum Records, J.D. Souther, Richie, and I. And we each had the option of making a solo album. And I made a solo album. I'd never done that before. I was always the shy kid in the back of the band. And I did a solo album called Slippin' Away. Uh, a lot of songs I'd written, and I had some really good players on it. And it was quite good. It came out really well. And I, Chris Hillman Band, I put a band together, and I'm touring. Make an album, tour. Make an album, tour. Come back, do another album. And it wasn't the greatest record in the world, but it was OK. I toured some more, and then I sort of stopped. And I said, OK, now what are we doing? Am I going to go back to school now? Yeah. It was 1975 or so. And I find out that Roger McGuinn, who had kept the birds together after I left for about two years, and then he decided he was, wanted to do something else. And he had gotten back together with Gene Clark. So two of my old bandmates from the birds are playing as a duet. And they called me and they said, do you want to sing with us? I said, yeah. So we started a band. 
McGuinn Clark Hillman. In the 1970s, I was in two rock and roll bands that sounded like law firms. Souther Hillman Fure and McGuinn Clark Hillman. Go figure. <laughs> McGuinn Clark and Hillman was a good band because we had that history that Souther Hillman Fure did not have, it, have. So we had that history. We played well together. We had hits on the radio, this and that. And we played all over Europe and Japan, this and that. We did about two albums, three. Gene Leaves again, Pattern Leaves. Roger and I sitting there in the studio going, okay, here we are again. We finished another album and then we came back from New York, it was about 1979 or thereabouts, and Roger says, you know, I, I think I'm gonna do something else. I said, okay. He said, I'm gonna go back and uh, play solo. And he went, he wanted to get back into folk music. That was his first love, was folk music. He grew up with listening to Pete Seeger and trying to emulate him. So he did that and I went, you know, that's interesting. And I went back and got the mandolin and went back to square one and started playing bluegrass festivals and folk clubs with Al Perkins, a fellow I had brought from the burritos in Manassas. He actually went into Souther Hill and Fury too, but Al and I went out as a duet. And then we enlarged the band. We had a bass player named Bill Bryson, and then we had Bernie Ledden join us. Now, Bernie was a fellow I knew from San Diego, and he had played in the Burrito Brothers. Then he formed the Eagles with Don Henley and Glenn Fry and Randy Meister. He was one of the founding members. In 1981, he had left the Eagles, and he was playing with me and Bill and Al, and we were going off uh, Chris Hillman Band, this and that. And I made two albums in, this, in the uh, early 80s. Uh, the Golden State Boys record that was on the shelf got picked up by Sugar Hill Records, a wonderful label in Durham, North Carolina. Still, to get, still out there, this, this label. And uh, they dealt in bluegrass music. Doc Watson was on that label. Lots of big acts in that sense. And I remember calling the head of Sugar Hill and I said, uh, this is great, you're gonna put the Gold State Boys. Well, now it was called the Hillman. Somehow it had changed to the H-I-L-L-M-E-N. I'm going, okay, whatever, but it was a good record. <laughs> and I said, uh, I'd like to talk to you maybe someday about a solo album. He says, when do you want to start? I said, God, I says, when do you want to So I do a solo album for uh, Barry Poss at Sugar Hill Records, I, uh, acoustic bluegrass album and Herb's working on it, all my friends are, Tim Schmidt is working on all these guys, and then I do a second album uh, for Sugar Hill, which is an electric country album called Desert Rose, after a song I had written. I kept writing songs since 1967, and I was touring with the quartet, with Bernie and Bill, and we met another fellow named John Jorgensen, 22 years old. I'm sure you've seen John at the Olivas Park you see how brilliant he is. Well, he was 22 years old back then, phenomenal musician. And so it was John and Bill and uh, Al and I. Bernie had gone off to do a rock band or something, so we were doing that for a while. And then we went on tour with Dan Fogelberg. So another good thing happens. Dan had made a bluegrass album called High Country Snows, and I sang on it. He had called me to do some vocal sessions with him, and I went down and did that, and he said, can you put a bluegrass band together to back me on a tour? And I want to do the bluegrass album, and I want to do the other stuff that I've had on the radio. And I said, okay. So I, I take Bill, I take John Jorgensen, and I get Herb Peterson. And I said, Herb was such a great singer and great banjo player, we had to have him in this band. And we, excuse me, we went out and we backed Dan on the road for about three weeks. This is 83, 84. Come back, John is, pushing and very ambitious, wants to get a country band going. I said, oh my God, I don't want to do another band. And he talked me into it. And we started playing at the Palomino in North Hollywood. We got J.D. Manus, who was a steel player who I'd worked with on the Sweetheart of the Rodeo. Is this making sense to all of you? Sweetheart of the Rodeo album in 1968. So we had J.D. Manus, John Jorgensen, Herb and Bill, and Steve Duncan, a fellow I didn't know, but was a wonderful drummer. And that was the beginning of what was to come. We played the Palomino and one night, I think the Academy of Country Musics had had an awards show that night and in comes a couple of the Oak Ridge boys and they watched us play and they were so nice to us. They gave us our first break. Bill Golden, who was a, one of the Oak Ridge boys, put us on their Las Vegas date at the MGM Grand, which I think was a week long. And it was so funny, I remember I took a picture. Oak Ridge boys, and it said Chris Hillman underneath, I said, 
what am I, the comic? I'm the opening the show. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't have a band name. Uh, but uh, everything was working really well. And here's a situation where I wasn't uh, obsessing over something. I was just letting it happen. I'm not going after it. We got a record deal offered to us from MCA Curb. Curb being the former lieutenant governor. Anyway, so we made a, a deal with them, and we went to Nashville and made our first album. And we named our band the Desert Rose Band after the song Desert Rose I'd written. And the first album, a lot of the material was stuff I'd written. We cut, and there was a song we did, an old country hit called Ashes of Love that I had recorded previously on uh, an album. And we cut that up, that song, and they released it as a single. It climbed up into the teens on the Billboard chart. Which I thought, OK, I'm not jumping around. The second song they put out was a song called Love Reunited that I'd written with a fellow I'd met in Ventura here, Steve Hill. And the day I met Steve Hill through another friend, we wrote a song together. The first day we met each other, 25 years ago, if not longer, Love Reunited. They put that out as a single. And I'm getting phone calls. This is climbing. This is climbing. And the greatest phone call I got was, I think we have a top 10 single next week. The charts are coming out on Monday. I went, what? This isn't supposed to happen. I said to my wife, this isn't supposed to happen. I'm always, the, you know, this happening. You know, we do this, you tour, you make a record. And all of a sudden, that song shot up to number three. And from then on in the Desert Rose Band, we had an eight-year run. We had a lot of hit singles, number one singles. We had top 10 singles. The band was fantastic. We were so good, all professional. I always thought our, our, uh, we were in the 90 percentile as far as live performances. We worked two, excuse me, two years in a row at the Ventura County Fair on the main stage. That was nice, being in the hometown guy and everything. And we stayed together, worked with Reba McIntyre, with the Oak Ridge Boys again. We worked with Merle Haggard all over. We did a wonderful thing, worked a lot of TV, this and that. And in the early 90s, um, I was getting tired. I, and I, missing my kids' birthdays. And around the early 90s, Garth Brooks had come out huge. And radio changed. All of a sudden, bands like the Desert Rose Band and uh, other artists like us uh, were not getting the airplay they used to. They were going more for a Garth Brooks sound. And I said to the guys, I said, we need to, uh, we need to stop now. And we stopped as friends. A lot of times you break up a band, it's not the nicest situation. We were very good friends. We worked with each other throughout the 90s and on into the next century, uh, doing things with each other. I made a couple of, a lot of records. Herb Peterson produced me on two solo albums, and Herb and I made records, and then Herb and I started working together as a duet, mandolin and guitar. And I, you know, I've known Herb since 1963. And um, it was great. We had so much fun. Well, anyway, long comes 2016, and Herb says, uh, listen, I've got an offer to go out with Tom Petty. I said, OK. I said, I won't take any bookings till you're done. Tom hired Herb to go out and sing background vocals, and Tom was doing a tour with his original band, Mud Crutch. I love these names. Squirrel Barkers, Mud Crutch. And uh, while he's out there, or prior to, or when he came home for a few days or something, Herb's dear friend, Pete DeCoast, says to Herb, Herb, why don't you and Petty produce Hillman? And unbeknownst to me, Herb goes to Tom on the road, rejoins him on the road, and he says this, and Tom said, absolutely. And Herb gets done with the tour. It's September of 2016, and he says, call Tom Petty. I think we might have something going here. And I knew Tom. I didn't know him that well, but I called him up. I said, Tom, uh, do you want to do this? He said, do you want me to? I said, do you want to make this commitment? He said, do you want me to? Back and forth. I said, Tom, I'd be honored to work with you. I said, but you haven't heard any of my songs. He said, I'm not worried. I said, well, I'm worried. I don't know. He said, well, I'll let you know if I don't like them. I said, fair enough. He says, well, go into my studio and we'll start in January 2017. And we did. First, he thought we were going to do a folk album, but it became more of an electric, semi-acoustic electric album. It was a joy. It was a, such a wonderful time. Uh, every day, that album was completed in six weeks. We used the Heartbreakers on a few tracks. Herb ran the band in the studio. John Jorgensen played on it, Herb, and a bass player, Mark Fain, because Bill couldn't do it. He had 
some issue, health issues. So the first album, Bill Bryson had not played with me in 25 years. So there's Mark and John and Herb and I, and Tom played on it, the Heartbreakers. It was wonderful. Now I'm gonna tell you about Tom for a minute. I got to know him really well. I can't tell you how wonderful that man was. I could, it was hard for me because he was the most humble guy I've ever met that occupied that position of international rock star. Ever so humble, sweet man, and went out of his way to help me and to help all of us. He'd be the first guy in the studio every day. We worked at his studio in, in the valley. We worked at his studio at, at his house in Malibu. And the album came out great. Biden My Time is the title of that album. It was a song I'd written for the Desert Rose Band in the 80s, and we never got around to cutting it. As, time, as things would work out, it worked out better this time around. We finished the album in uh, February and made plans to go out and what? Promote the album on tour. John, Herb, Mark Fain, and myself go out and tour. Late summer, early fall. In October, I was in Nashville, early October, and I'm sitting in my room and Connie's with me, my wife, and I hear Tom Petty had passed away. And I couldn't believe it. I just could not believe it. I, I, as we all are, we're in denial sometimes. And then David Crosby calls me out of nowhere. He says, whoa, what do you think of Tom? And I said, I don't know. And David had worked on Biden on the album with me on a song, and Roger McGuinn had worked on it. So it was very familiar stuff there. And they'd been wonderful to help me on this solo album. I forgot to tell you that part. But anyway, David calls me. I said, I, I, I'm, I don't know. I hope it's not true. And David says, all right, I'll, we'll talk later. I had four more shows to do with these guys, and I called Herb in his room. I said, I want to cancel these shows. I, I'm really upset. I'm devastated. Roger McGuinn calls me out of nowhere, and we talk, and he says, I said, I'm, I had four more shows, Roger. I'm going to cancel them. He says, no, you're not. I said, what? He says, no, you're not. Roger and Tom were very close friends. They toured together. They wrote songs together. He knew Tom very well. I said, do not do this. Tom would not like it if you were canceling shows. Go out and celebrate him every night for what he did for you. And I did. I went out every night and I dedicate this show to Tom for all he did for me. And we finished the tour in November, late November. And December 4th, I'm having dinner celebrating my birthday in Camarillo with my wife my daughter, our granddaughter, and her husband, who's a Ventura County firefighter. He gets a text, fire in Santa Paula. He says, okay, I'm on call, we can finish dinner. My wife and I go home, and the wind is coming up. I said, whoa, the wind, it's like 8.30 at night, and it's, it's blowing. I mean, they say 60 mile an hour, I think it was like 70 mile an hour winds. And we go in the house, and we get ready, we go to get in bed to go to sleep, and the power goes out, and you've all have experienced this fire. I'm sure some of you out here have done that. And uh, my wife says, I said, don't go to sleep. It's OK. She says, I smell smoke. And she gets up and goes to the window, and all I hear is, oh my god. And the entire ridge was on fire. I said, OK, we're getting out of here. We've got to get out of here. Nobody told me to evacuate, but I went outside, and my neighbor's out there. And he said, I was beating on your door, and I, I didn't know if you were home, and nobody answered. I said, we were asleep. And so we get the car out, prop up the garage door, get the car out, and we load up the good mandolin Stephen gave me, a good guitar, mementos, passports, everything of value in the car. I had to finally tell Connie, get in the car. We cannot stay up here. If that wind changes, we're going to die up here. I mean it. We had to get out of there. And we go down the hill. And of course, as some of you may know, I'm listening to KVTA, and they're saying, go to the fairgrounds. Well, I started to go to the fairgrounds. I'm in a bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. I said, uh-uh. I pull out of the line, and I'm looking for a hotel. And you know what that was like. There were no hotel rooms at all. People were going down to the valley to get a room. Nothing. And around that time, uh, my friend John Jorgensen, who was living in Ventura at that point, and called me, and he said, come to our house. He lived off of Foothill quite a ways from the actual fire on the hillside. And we stayed with John that night, and John and I were outside that night watching it just tearing up the whole
whole hillside. You see these houses exploding. It was just, it was unbelievable. And the next morning, we wake up at John's, and Connie goes out on the corner of Foothill, and Eugenia was a fireman in a truck. Not a big fire truck, but a truck, truck, truck. And, and she says, uh, can you go up, up, to, up the street up here to our house? and see if it's still there. He said, let me check. And he got permission from his captain and um, drove up there. He said, I'll call you in 30 minutes. Give me your cell phone. He goes up and he calls us in 30 minutes. He said, I think your house is okay, but everything around you is gone. So we go, oh my God. Well, later, about an hour later, we got permission to go up and went up the hill. And I said, Connie, we might not have a house, but we're alive. We're, we're fine. And we go up the hill and there, by the grace of God, is our house, the structure there. It's all there. We lost our kitchen. We lost our family room. Everybody around me was gone. On either side of me and on the street behind me, gone. It looked like a war zone. It was unbelievable. And I know a lot of you, as I said, are probably saw and experienced it in some way or another. And what had happened with us was we just happened. There was happened to be a couple of fellows from Simi Valley, was it Station 41, Lance? <laughs> so they actually, I think somebody had seen my neighbor's balcony go through the window of our kitchen and ignite it. And then there was a truck came up. And they had just enough water on the truck. And they knocked my door down. I, they, I know they told me this a couple days later. A couple of fellows came by and, and said, uh, I think we can save this house. They went in and, and they soaked out the kitchen and the family. And they saved my house. First responders. Heroes. Absolute heroes. So Captain Lance Austin, who's here tonight with his lovely wife, Kimberly, thank you so much. Thank you. We were out of our house, uh, oh, we were out of our house for about eight months. And, you know, like everybody else, we dealt with it. And, and of course, the Montecito thing came along weeks later it was terrible or a week later awful uh, we all survived we all survived thank God and uh, we're back in our house now and they're building next door to us on either side of us which is good and here I am and uh, but something else happened I have to tell you something wonderful so while we're out of our house and we're living in a rented house I get a phone call from Roger McGuinn and he says you know I've been in South America with my wife Camilla and I had an idea he said, you know, next August is the anniversary of the Sweetheart of the Rodeo album. It's been 50 years. And I went, yeah. And he goes, well, I've been talking to Marty Stewart. And he said, what do you think about going out on the road with Marty and his band and you and I, and we celebrate this album and do, do some shows? I said, I'm there. I'd love to. Now, I hadn't worked with Roger for 30 years, and I loved working with Roger. He was a joy to work. And Marty I had known from country music in the late 80s in the Desert Rose Band. So we started working in June and worked all the way up until December 19th. Marty had other com uh, commitments with Chris Stapleton. So we worked around him. I don't think I've ever had, I've, one of the best tours I've been on, if not the best, really good. The guys were great, great band. We had such a great time. And I find out a little later that Roger had called Marty and he said, uh, we need to get Chris going again. He's had a tough year. Lost Tom, he lost, he's almost lost his house and Marty was right on board and uh, that's how that all happened. It was a joyful, joyful tour. I love them all. And here I am tonight and I'm working with Herb still and I love Herb and I'm going to tell you about him. Herb Peterson, one of the greatest singers I've ever worked with. Absolutely one of the greatest and has sung on everybody's album. He was the most highly sought after session singer and guitar and banjo player in LA. And he worked for Linda Ronstadt, Emmy Lou Harris, John Fogarty, Tom Petty, Kenny Rogers, James Taylor, Jackson Brown, worked with John Denver and his band for a long time. One of those guys that makes us all sound good and he is so good in his own right. I want you to please Welcome my dear, dear friend, Herb Peterson.
I forgot to take my mandolin out, but we're going to do some songs for you uh, as soon as I get ready here. Where's that darn road manager we had tonight, Herb? <laughs> I don't think we had one. <laughs> so as you can imagine, we go back many, many years. Thanks, Father Grant. <laughs> Father Gary Kiriaku. Okay, so we're going to do the very first song. Are we on? Are you on? Fellas, let's get the sound on. And I'll tell you about this song. This is the very first song I ever wrote called Time Between. I wrote it in 1967. I had been doing sessions for Hugh Masekela, the jazz trumpeteer from South Africa. And, uh, I had such an incredible time doing that session or that whole day or maybe two days. And he was recording this gal from South Africa, Letta Mbulu. And she sounded like Peggy Lee. And here I am playing bass with these guys. They're all jazz players. And they, they liked what I was doing and everything. I came home, I was so excited, I wrote a song, a country song. Go figure, I'm playing a jazz session. <laughs> this is called Time Between, first song. When I hear your voice Through love and trust It's gonna work out fine The only pain I feel Is all this time between You and me You and me All the days have turned to years Only emphasize my fear Since you said goodbye So David Crosby sets me up on a blind date, right? I'm not kidding. And she was a lovely lady. We had nothing in common. It was not a good blind date, and she's a nice gal. But I got home that night and I wrote, Have you seen her face? Because she was a very pretty girl. That was the last date. <laughs>
you locked in her spell. All the sights and the sounds, senses will be found. Only time will tell how much love can be to wait so patiently. Wait and see. Rancho Santa Fe was interesting when I was living down there, a young fellow in the 1950s, it was about 750 people, and some of the most interesting characters lived in that town, one of which was a man that had worked in the film industry in the 20s, John Robertson. He was a director, screenwriter, actor. He directed John Barrymore in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in the late 20s. He, the last movie he did was a Shirley Temple movie in 30, 1935. Then he retired, came down to Rancho. Big horseman. He used to ride his horse to the post office and get his mail once in a while. And just a wonderful man. Big, long, handlebar mustache. Well, always wore a Stetson hat. Loved kids. Just the sweetest man in the world, old John Robertson. So I wrote a song about him in 1968 with Roger McGuinn. I told him, I said, Roger, I think we got an interesting song here about this gentleman from Rancho Santa Fe. song in 1969 and we were sharing a house and all the tunes we were writing this one sort of wrote itself it was about we were writing about the culture interestingly enough nothing's changed actually but, um, Sin City and uh, it was like this <laughs> this old town's 
filled with sin. It'll swallow you in if you've got some money to burn. Take it home right away. You've got years to pay, and see is waiting in his turn. This old earthquake's gonna leave me in the poor house. It seems like this whole town's insane. On the third
Green pastures are calling I'll find peace of mind once again Just on my saddle, the clouds in my mind. I'm just biding my time till I leave this old city.
very much. As always, Song of Toms that I recorded on the album. Her brought to me, I'd never heard this song. I'd never heard it. And we got invited to, to do a Music Cares, which was honoring Tom that year in 2000. Was it 2017, early? And her says, we can, this is a song we should do, Wildflowers. I'd never heard this song before. At least I said, Tom, do you mind if we take a stab at this on the album? He said, oh my god, I'd be honored. So we got to. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Herb. Thank you, buddy. 